Welcome to another edition of your Effective Living series coming to you on CTFM and CTTV. My name is Bernard Avle. This first week, we're looking at the physical preparation for the year 2023 under the broad theme of 2023 Starter Pack. Today, we're talking about lifestyle diseases and we'll zero in on one of the commonest, diabetes. My guest is a consultant endocrinologist and diabetologist. It's just a powerful thing. She is also the head of the National Diabetes Management and Research Center, author as well of this wonderful book called Let's Talk Diabetes. I'll tell you more about this book later. Dr. Jacob Asante, good to have you. Thank you, Bernard. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too. So lifestyle diseases are very common diseases. We read about them in the news first, but what do they mean for those of us who are not doctors and scientists? When you say lifestyle disease, what do you mean by that? Well, when we talk about a lifestyle disease, mm. it's a disease that you get mm. by your daily habits, mm -hmm. what you do or what you don't do. Because there are things we must do and there are things we shouldn't do. Okay. And so there are sometimes you can get some of these diseases just because of what you do habitually or repeatedly or what you do not do habitually or repeatedly. And what has the reason that a non-communicable diseases? Well, most of the non-communicable diseases are lifestyle, you know, are, are lifestyle diseases. So. Okay. So as against infectious diseases? Yes. Infectious diseases, you don't have much control over it. Somebody gets something, they infect you. So COVID is an infectious disease? An infectious disease. You can't do help. But you can have a husband living with you who has a lifestyle disease, but you choose to do the right thing, and you won't get the, uh, you know, that particular lifestyle disease. So, so as Captain Planet said, in lifestyle disease, the power is yours. It is yours, really. Okay. So what are the general types of lifestyle diseases or examples of lifestyle diseases? Well, there are many lifestyle diseases, but we can mention a few. Mm -hmm. The commonest, let's say, are what we call the broad group of diseases called cardiovascular diseases. And cardiovascular diseases are diseases of the heart and the blood vessels in the body. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, we have diseases like obesity. Mm -hmm. Years ago, we didn't think obesity was a disease. We thought mm -hmm. obesity was a symptom of you know, a disease. Mm -hmm. But now we realize that Obesity in itself is a disease on its own because it has complications. Mm -hmm. Then we have diseases like type 2 diabetes, and I'm mm -hmm. sure we'll come to that later mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. We have diseases like um, some cancers actually can are lifestyle diseases. For example, if you smoke, you are prone or you're at risk of getting lung cancer. So some cancers can be lifestyle diseases. Mm -hmm. Then we have diseases like chronic respiratory diseases mm -hmm. can also, you know, they are also non-communicable diseases but also can be lifestyle disease because one of the commonest um, respiratory diseases, what we call chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease, COPD, is common in people who smoke as well. So, you know, the, the list is, is long, long, but... So under cardiovascular, I'm guessing high blood pressure, mm -hmm. strokes... Strokes, heart uh, attacks... Heart attacks are under the cardiovascular under diseases. Under the cardiovascular. Then, then obesity is... On its own. On its own. And type 2, diabetes. Yeah. You distinguish type 2 from the other types. Yes. Which means that type 1 is not a lifestyle. lifestyle. It's You're more right. like hereditary. Yes. Then you have, uh, you mentioned the fourth one. COPD. Chronic respiratory something. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. For those who smoke. Yes. I see. Uh, which of these is the commonest? Of all the lifestyles you mentioned, is the common? In Ghana. Well, I think... Cardiovascular disease will be the commonest. Generally. But generally. But the highest contributor of cardiovascular disease is probably type 2 diabetes. Hey, so type 2 is also contributing to cardiovascular. Yes. Well, it's standing on its own it's as well. It's standing on its own, but hey. it feeds heavily into cardiovascular disease. And wow. so we must, we must look at that very carefully. I see. Um, again, while we're in this corridor of lifestyle cardiovascular, so what are the general lifestyles that predispose a person to say cardiovascular diseases? Well, we can start with physical activity. Okay. Physical activity is very, very important mm -hmm. in preventing a lot of cardi um, cardiovascular and other lifestyle diseases. Mm -hmm. Let's say I'm a Christian, so I, let's take the story of Genesis. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, when we were put in the Garden of Eden, I don't mm -hmm. think we were meant to sit down like this. <laughs> what were we meant to do? We we're supposed to tend move. the farms, yes. move, mm -hmm. chase the cheetahs and the lions and keep them, mm -hmm. you know. But unfortunately or fortunately, now mm -hmm. we find ourselves in a situation where we sit for long hours. And you get home tired. You've been working. It's just that you haven't been active. Mm -hmm. And so physical inactivity is a very major risk 
factor mm -hmm. in lifestyle diseases. Okay. Our food is mm. also an important risk factor. Okay. What we eat, what we shouldn't eat, what we are eating too much of, mm. becomes very important in lifestyle diseases. And I'm mm -hmm. sure you would have discussed it earlier. Mm -hmm. We can touch briefly on it if necessary. Yeah. And of course, what you inhale. What, what you, you inhale, <laughs> what you smoke, what you drink. What you drink. What you drink is mm. important. Mm. Okay. Brilliant. Let's come to diabetes. Right. Um, generally, they, when I was young, they said, oh, if you eat sugar, you got diabetes. So don't eat too much sugar. That's what I was told. But I, I'm, I'm told that that's not actually what it is. There, there's, there's more nuance than that. So what is diabetes? Why are there types of diabetes? So diabetes, largely, diabetes just means that you have a lot of blood sugar, sugar in your blood. Mm -hmm. And you get blood sugar being high because there's something in your body that must cater for your blood sugar that doesn't work properly. Mm -hmm. Anytime we eat, the food is converted to glucose and it's in our blood. Mm -hmm. Something must take the blood glucose or the glucose from the blood and give it to the body, give it to the muscles, give it to mm -hmm. the heart, give it to every part of the body needs this blood sugar. Nothing is called insulin. Mm -hmm. When you have a problem with insulin, then you get your sugar remains high and people call it or it's called starvation in the midst of plenty. Mm. So there's blood sugar, there's high blood sugar. Meanwhile, the rest of the body that needs the sugar is starving because there's a defect in insulin. Either you don't have any insulin at all or you don't have enough insulin or you have insulin, but it, doesn't, it just doesn't work properly. Oh. And that sort of clarifies, you know, the types. The types. Mm. So to get this point, most food you eat converts to glucose. Glucose must be absorbed into your system. Yes. Insulin is what helps that to happen. Yes, so insulin not, moves it from moves the blood, it from away the blood, from the blood into the tissues. Creates the key. Yes. Now, if insulin is absent, the blood, the glucose cannot enter. Yes. If insulin is in small quantities. Some will enter, but most of it will, will be not. in blood. Or if insulin is there, but it's not working well. Yes. So that's why. So which one is type 1 diabetes? Which one is type 2? Which one is type so the type 1 diabetes are those who do not have insulin at all. And usually because the production site of insulin called the pancreas has been destroyed by the body's own antibodies. Mm. Now we all have antibodies. If you've had COVID before, you probably have antibodies to COVID. And so for some unknown reason, mm. the body now <coughs> forms antibodies against the pancreas, which is a factory of insulin production, and mm -hmm. destroys it. And so in type 1 diabetes, they often do not have insulin at all. And so wow. the, blood just the sugar just stays in the blood and doesn't feed the body. So what does the sugar feeding the body do? Is that what makes you able to move and get energy? The sugar in our body or the glucose in our body is the body's fuel. Okay. That is what we run on. Without glucose, your body doesn't you know, function properly. You can't function so if properly. The, if the system doesn't absorb the glucose, even though there's sugar in your body, it's not helping you to do anything. Anything. It's That's why I, I say that it's called starvation it's in the, the midst, midst of plenty. plenty. Just so like having a, f a tank full of fuel, but you don't have, I'm not sure whether it's transmitters or the pump or something isn't yeah. working very well. So the pancreas is what produces the insulin. Yes. And in type 1 diabetes, is type 1 diabetes hereditary? Yes, largely her hereditary. So it's not, nothing to do with your lifestyle? No. Initially, I see. What percentage of diabetes in Ghana is type 1? Generally, we say that about 10%, 8 to 10% of diabetes is type 1. Okay. And about 90% is type 2. Ooh. Which one is type 2 diabetes then? So type 2 diabetes is why we are here. It's the one mm -hmm. that is a lifestyle disease. Mm -hmm. It's because of largely, even though there's a very big family component or a genetic component, mm -hmm. largely there's something you can do about type 2 diabetes. Mm. Especially if you are inactive, you, are, you have a sedentary lifestyle, you are not eating right, you are overweight or obese, you have hypertension, you have all the other, some of the other risk factors. And type 2 can be, you know, you can do something about type 2 diabetes. Mm. But type 1, there, there isn't much, you can, much you can do to prevent yeah. it. This is the Effective Living Series, and we're talking lifestyle diseases. My guest is Dr. Jacob Atiasi. We're discussing generally lifestyle disease, but I'm zeroing on type 2 diabetes. Not just because she has a beautiful book about it. It's more like a self-help book, but it's because the more knowledge you have, the longer you live. Apparently, this is a quote in the book. So uh, I'm told that it, there was a quote you said that somebody said knowledge is one of the treatments for diabetes. And the, the person said, no, knowledge is the main treatment. Yes. So the more information you have, yes. the better your lifestyle. So you've spoken about diet, you've spoken about exercise. So if you talk about type two, what 
can you elaborate on the lifestyles that predisposes a person to get type 2 diabetes? So some of the lifestyle, you know, things that we do that can predispose you to type 2 diabetes, we've said it already, mm -hmm. is being sedentary. Mm -hmm. Also, often, uh, you know, we don't eat right. Mm -hmm. We have high carbohydrate meals, mm. very high in fats, very little protein. We don't eat fruits and vegetables. Mm. And these are important to prevent type 2 diabetes. Mm. There are many other things, too much alcohol drinking, mm. you know. And recently, it's been even said that poor sleep, if you don't sleep properly, it can predispose you to type 2 diabetes. Wow. So uh, when it comes to lifestyle, what do we do every day? Every day we, we eat, every day we move, every day we sleep. Mm. The, the very things, the basic mm -hmm. things that we do every day, we mm. must do them right. Otherwise, we expose ourselves to getting some well, of When them. you say carbohydrates, I, I think you need to elaborate a bit because uh, I think one of the previous speakers was talking about um, macronutrients and micronutrients. She was talking about, like, for example, she said kinky is not the same as rice in that conversation and white rice not the same as brown rice so apparently even with food there are different types of carbohydrates and what they do i just wanted to touch a bit on on, on that so in ghana generally we eat a lot of carbohydrates yes, so do. mostly big fufu soup around it with a lot of meat the food the food doesn't look green at all is there any formula for good diet that helps you to reduce your predisposition to type 2 diabetes so what I'm coming to tell you is mm -hmm. what we actually tell patients to eat in terms of diet. Mm -hmm. And that is what everybody must do to prevent diabetes. Mm -hmm. Generally, if you take a plate of food, about a quarter of it must be carbohydrates. Oh, just one quarter? Yes. Serious. Then about half thereabout should be vegetables and, you know, a bit of fruits. Mm -hmm. Then you can have a little bit, the other quarter being protein and a little bit of fat. Serious. And with the carbohydrates, mm. we have the ones that are preferred, the mm. complex carbohydrates, mm -hmm. the unrefined carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. These are broken down very slowly mm -hmm. and will raise your blood sugar also slowly compared to the polished or refined carbohydrates like polished rice or a fizzy drink. It's all carbohydrates. To be converted into sugar very rapidly and so, you know, and very high. Your sugar levels will go very high. So those ones are preferred and I'm sure that's why your the person before me, the diet therapist, said that um, not all carbohydrates are the same. Because, yes, we have the refined carbohydrates and the unrefined carbohydrates. Mm. And you must choose the unrefined as much as possible. Mm. So the unrefined ones are what you call in the book slow-release carbohydrates. Slow release Brown carbohydrates. rice, whole meal, bread, kinky wheat, and oats. Yes. Whereas the fast-release carbohydrates are usually sugary carbohydrates, digested quickly and absorbed rapidly, raising blood glucose to higher levels. So that if you are having challenges with your insulin, then you are going to suffer more. Yes. And then you talk about fizzy drinks, sugary biscuits, cakes, sweets, ripe plantain, and white rice. Then you said something which, which really struck me in your, your discussion of carbohydrates. Or no, I think in fats. You said there are also two types of fats. Monosaturated oils and polysaturated fats. As in, one is better than the other. So we have the saturated and you know, non-saturated fats. Mm -hmm. Even with the non-saturated or, you know, unsaturated fats, we have the mono and the poly. Mm -hmm. And so you must distinguish between the two. I'm not a dietitian, mm -hmm. but if you see a dietitian or, a, you know, a nutritionist, they'll mm -hmm. take you through it. Mm -hmm. And in the book, I advise that don't just take a book. This is not supposed to be a consultation. You still need a dietitian. The diet therapists are very important in managing um, your, your, your health. Yeah. A few years ago, I went to see a nutritionist. Mm -hmm. and. I was surprised because I thought I knew it all. But I was surprised. She managed to teach me a few tricks. I found out at the time that my carbohydrate intake wasn't that much. But I think my food was generally oily and I was using the wrong kind of fats. So it's important that you see a dietitian yeah. to help you. I know, but on page 27, uh, there's something I like there. So you distinguish between polyunsaturated fats found in plant oils like vegetable oil and sunflower oil. And then you said monounsaturated fats are found in olive oil and mostly nuts and oil. And they are the most beneficial fats and if you must consume fat. So basically you're saying olive oil and nuts and oils are better than vegetable and sunflower oil. And then you said the worst type of fat is called trans fat. Trans fat. And that too much of it will raise your bad cholesterol, increase your risk of heart disease and other health problems. So you mentioned cholesterol now. And you said bad cholesterol. What is that? 
So cholesterol, oftentimes people are told that you have cholesterol in your body, so watch your diet. I must say here that most of the cholesterol in the body is produced in the liver. The body mm -hmm. produces itself. Mm -hmm. We just tell you to reduce what you are taking to, you know, about the 10%, cut mm -hmm. down on that. There are different types of cholesterol. We have the high-density lipoprotein or high-density cholesterol, which is supposed to be the good fat, mm -hmm. which mops up the bad fat or mm -hmm. the bad cholesterol. And we have the low-density lipoprotein, which is what actually lines the blood vessels and predispose you to heart attacks and strokes and, you know, peripheral vascular disease, amongst other things. Mm -hmm. So these ones must, the low-density lipoprotein must be reduced and the high-density lipoprotein, as much as possible, must come up because they have different roles in the body. Mm. Finally, here, before we move something, I said that overheating oil and repeated use of oil can lead to trans fat formation. Trans fat is the worst kind of fat for your health. Too much of it will raise your bad cholesterol. So those of you like frying yam 20 times in the same oil or kelly willy or whatever, that's not a, a very good thing. Now, let's talk about prediabetes. So you said there's type 1, which is hereditary. You can't do anything about it. Type 2 is lifestyle. But you also mentioned pre. Is, what is prediabetes? So prediabetes, oh, in prediabetes, your blood sugar is higher than normal, mm -hmm. but it's not as high as, you know, the cutoff we give for patients with diabetes. Unfortunately, even with prediabetes, your risks for some of the complications of diabetes remain high. Mm. And so you must do something about it. Thankfully, prediabetes is potentially reversible. Mm. You can do something about it. And that is why mm. I guess we are here, because mm. you can actually reverse, you can come back from prediabetes to the normal <coughs> range, mm. just by your lifestyle changes. Okay. Watching your diet, you know, exercising, being more physically active, can reduce your risk of progressing, progression from prediabetes to type 2 diabetes. Mm. And I say somewhere that most patients who have type 2 diabetes had prediabetes at some point in their lifetime, mm. and they could have, you know, come back to normal. Mm. So if you have prediabetes, it's not minor. And oftentimes people come and say, oh, somebody told me that I was borderline, but they didn't tell me what to do. Well, if somebody tells you that you are borderline, you have to do something about it. Ask them. So how do I reverse it? Mm. And you can reverse it by your lifestyle changes, increasing your physical activity, watching your diet, losing weight if you are overweight or obese, and hopefully, you know, you can reduce your chances of progressing to type 2 diabetes. Mm. So uh, pre-diabetes is reversible through these things you've mentioned. Now, when you talk of risk factors for diabetes, generally, you've mentioned family history of diabetes and then dietary habits and that kind of thing. Now, how do you know your status, whether it's type 1, type 2, or prediabetes? How do you know that you have that? What, what do you used to tell? So the, the doctor will decide. Mm -hmm. We have blood tests that we can use to determine whether you are type 1 or type 2. Mm -hmm. Although even in, in practice, we don't use those labs very much. Mm -hmm. We can use your clinical, you know, how you presented, mm -hmm. your age, for example. Mm -hmm. Type 1 diabetes is usually found in young adults, you know. But, mm. uh, but elderly people are now getting type 1 diabetes. Wow. Um, type 2 usually is found in elderly people. But currently, young children, teenagers are getting type 2 diabetes because all these lifestyle things we are mentioning are becoming predominant in young children. Mm -hmm. Years ago, children, you hardly find children who are obese or inactive mm -hmm. because kids used to play pillow low and high jump and all those things. Mm -hmm. Now, what do kids love to do? They love to sit behind a screen and if you, if, you, if you leave them, they can play video games from morning till night. Mm -hmm. And so kids are becoming prone to type 2 diabetes as well as you know, uh, as, as well as adults. Mm -hmm. So, but there are, there are other risk factors. There are risk factors that you can't do anything about. Mm -hmm. Age is a risk factor. Every day you are getting, your risk of getting lifestyle disease like type 2 diabetes is getting higher because you are aging, mm -hmm. okay? There's nothing you can do about it. If you, are, if you are male, your risk of cardiovascular disease and other, you know, lifestyle diseases is probably higher. There's nothing you can do about it. But there are things we are talking about that are reversible, potentially reversible, mm. and you can do something about it. If you are overweight or obese, this is a time to consider highly putting in measures to reduce your, your weight mm -hmm. and, and, and getting your weight back to normal so mm. that you reduce your risk of um, type 2 diabetes and mm. cardiovascular disease. This is still the Effective Living Series. We're talking to Dr. Jacob Atiasi, who is a, or a consultant endocrinologist and a diabetologist. By the way, what do those things mean? 
So <laughs> endocrine is a disease of, disease of a glands. So I do that. Diabetes is just one disease of one gland, which is a pancreas. So the endocrine system, which you learned in school, there yeah. are many of those glands. There are many glands, yes. So the endocrine system is where you have pancreas. What else do you have in the endocrine system? You have adrenal. Pituitary gland. Pituitary gland, adrenal. You Adrenaline have gland, yeah. Oh, yeah. Even the ovaries produce hormones. Testes produce hormones. So we deal with that. All but diabetes is probably the commonest um, endocrine disease. The thyroid. I'm sure you know the yes. thyroid where people thyroid have a goiter, gland. yes. So wow. we deal with that. But the di diabetes and the pancreas so is So you, you are a specialist in the endocrine system. And then you also diabetes is your specialty. And you are the uh, head of the National Diabetes Management and Research Center. Yes. Is this at Kolebu? It's at Kolebu. Wow. So there's a whole research area for diabetes. Yes. Wonderful. So let's come back to, I have some FAQs in your book. And by the way, where can I get this book to buy? I like the book. Where? Oh, it's, it's going to be in all shops um, from, from next week. You should find it in any, any oh, So I have it shop. before the other people have yes, it. Yes, but it should be available in all Now, you said shops. something here. You said, Elliot Jocelyn, the first American diabetes specialist, is quoted to have said, education is not a part of the treatment of diabetes. It is the treatment. Decades later, this quote is still relevant and true. Can you elaborate on this? Well, oftentimes we tell patients, you know, take your medicine, do this, do this. They're mm. given a tall list of things they must yeah. do. I think that type diabetes really, mm. if you understand the disease and know why you must do what you must do, mm -hmm. it becomes easy. And that becomes a cornerstone of your, of your treatment. You know why you must exercise. So you exercise, mm -hmm. not out of compulsion because your doctor says you must exercise. If you do it out of compulsion, mm. within two weeks, you know, you've given up. But if you really understand why you must do what you must do, then it becomes a habit. And once it's a habit, it's not painful. It's not done because under duress, and then it helps you generally. And so this quote I put in there because I still find that for chronic diseases, especially t t diabetes, you need to understand why you must do certain things. Mm. But it's not only for diabetes. I think for most chronic diseases, hypertension, HIV, you must understand your disease. Mm. You must know why your doctor says you should do this so that it's mm. easier for you to do. That's why I refer to it as a self-managed illness. It's a self-managed illness. So you said the management of diabetes is a, like a four-legged table with four legs. Education, dietary modification, exercise and medication. It's interesting, medication has been the last. Yes. That, that's extraordinary because usually you think when you go to a doctor, give me medicine. But you're basically saying educate yourself, look at your diet, talk to your dietitian, increase of physical activity, then you take the medication. You take the medication. So all of this together. Yes. I, amazing. All right, what is insulin and why do people who have diabetes inject themselves? Remember I said that anytime we eat the food is converted to glucose. Yeah. Now, insulin is a hormone mm -hmm. or is a chemical that is produced in a certain part of the body called the pancreas. Mm -hmm. And it moves from the pancreas to the blood and moves the glucose into the tissues, into the muscles where mm -hmm. glucose is actually needed. When you have glucose in blood, it's toxic. Mm. It shouldn't, you shouldn't have high levels of glucose in blood. Mm. Too much of it becomes you know, a poison in the system. Mm. So most of the glucose must be sent to the tissues of a body for the tissues to function well. So insulin basically is a hormone that moves in, um, glucose from blood into tissues. Mm. And in the book I describe it, and it's well known, I, it's not, I didn't write that. It's something that is well known that insulin is actually the key that opens the vessel, the, the cells of the body for glucose to enter effectively. Here are some FAQs I just want to ask. Why must I inject insulin? Why can't I just swallow it? Well, I said that insulin is a, is a chemical, but mm -hmm. importantly, if you go into detail, insulin is a protein. Mm -hmm. And so you can't take it, it will digest. Mm. So we put insulin directly under your skin, mm. which by an injection, and the blood, blood flows everywhere, and the blood carries it into the, into the system mm. for it to do its work. It mm. cannot be swallowed. A, a few years ago, you know, something came up, and I think it's still in the works. Mm -hmm. I'm sure sooner than later they will find a formulation that is not easily digestible, and okay. we'll all be happy for that. Somebody says, I don't eat sugar. Why do I have diabetes? Well, we've also discussed that already. Diabetes is not caused by eating sugar. You have a problem with sugar because your insulin is not working well. If you had enough insulin, mm. no matter how much sugar you ate, uh, insulin should be able to carry it across. 
However, if you, if you are at risk, say you have a family history, and you keep eating a lot of sugar, then you give your body too much work. Your body is under a lot of pressure to produce high levels of insulin. And at a point, it will just, you know, reach its limit and, and break down, and then mm. you will have diabetes. But it doesn't directly cause, sugar doesn't directly cause mm. um, diabetes. While the tests for diabetes are very many that you can tell us about, my question to you is, what should people see that should let them suspect that they need to talk to a doctor about diabetes? So what are some of the physical evidences in my body that will let me know that hey, I should go and check? You get, you get my yeah, question? I, I yeah, I get it. So what we call signs and symptoms, for yes. example. Yeah. So the, the common presentation will be when your sugar levels go very high, mm. you start urinating a lot. Okay. Especially at night. Mm. I have, yet, a few days ago, just before Christmas, I had a patient come to me who said, last night I woke up 12 times. So you wake up exhausted. Times. Yes. He just goes, walks back, falls asleep, and before <laughs> he can, yes. So they urinate a lot. And because they are urinating a lot, they drink a lot. Why, are they, urinating? They, are Why are they urinating a lot? You are, you are urinating a lot because the sugar in your blood now goes into your urine. And uh, once it's not it being absorbed. Over, it's not being absorbed. It spills over into your urine. So you have more urine. And it draws water with it. So it's dehydrating you. They are, and so they drink water. But what you, you think is that because I'm drinking water, I'm urinating. But it may, it's very well possible that you are urinating, you are drinking water because you are urinating. So the, the, the first sign is frequent urination. What well, other signs? High there? blood sugar will cause frequent urination, drinking lots of water. Mm -hmm. You may feel weak because glucose is not going into the system. It's just being poured out. So there's general weakness and lethargy. I mean, you're just not, you just mm -hmm. don't feel right. Mm -hmm. Some people will start getting blurred vision. Mm. Others will get, you know, what we call in the past, we used to call white. Females start getting mm -hmm. white because there's a lot of sugar in the urine and, you know, in that area. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of white because mm -hmm. The organisms also like sugar. They thrive on in, in sugar. But this is for people who get high blood sugar, you know, occurring very rapidly. In type 2 diabetes, it's such a slow process. And many patients with type 2 diabetes walk around and do not have any symptoms at all. Mm. So <coughs> do not wait to get these symptoms before you go and test. If you are an adult above 40, and this is the beginning of a year, mm. it's a good time mm. to test or go and see your doctor and have yourself tested for diabetes and other, you know, lifestyle disease. Or, you know, have a thorough medical checkup as mm. part of your New Year's resolutions. Start right with start, your health. Start the year right. For a yeah, sound right. mind, rest in a sound body or something like that. There's something like that. So there's a national diabetes center. Yeah. Is there a national, um, what do you call it, lifestyle disease center? In Ghana, something like I'm that. not aware of that. That's not like that. But, but I know generally, years mm -hmm. ago, they tried to promote the wellness clinics in all the hospitals. So those those will be there, the wellness wow. clinics. Yes. It's amazing. Um, I've I don't have a degree in that in in, in diet <laughs> in yeah. diabetes yet. But based on what you've taught me and what I've read, I'm knowing a lot about it. So thank you very much, Doctor Akoba Tiasi, for speaking to us on the Effective Living Series. This is just week one and. Week one is the physical preparation for the year. We've been talking in our third episode about lifestyle diseases, zeroing in on type 2 diabetes. And essentially, lifestyle, dieting, exercise, and all those things that we do can predispose or help reduce our risk factors. Thank you for talking to us. My name is Bernard Avler. Thank you for watching. We'll be back with another exciting episode next time. Bye-bye.